Hello, welcome to Advanced Retro Adaptics. This is Tyler Disney, and on today's episode, I have a conversation with Jack McClure. Jack, his wife Alana, and their not quite one year old baby walked most of the way from Canada to Mexico on the Pacific Crest Trail in 2023. They ended at my place in the southern Sierra Nevada mountains, which was a really wonderful experience for me. It was great to be able to spend so much time with them. And Jack got to work immediately writing a book on their experience on the trail. The name of the book is You Carry the Tent, I'll Carry the Baby. And uh, we talk about his book writing process and we talk about their experience on the trail in this conversation, which I hope you enjoy. Reading the, the latest version of your book was awesome. I mean, the first one was enjoyable, but like it was really cool how you cleaned it up and like some of the choices you made. It was really yeah. good. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's been, I guess, you know, you read the first one probably a couple months ago and since then added a bunch and then took a bunch out to clean it up. And yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I think it's a bit more streamlined now. And also I'm incredibly, uh, not envious. Uh, <laughs> it's not the right word. There's, there's, yeah, a mix of that. <laughs> there's a mix of envy, uh, flabbergastedness, uh, at how you were able to pull this off in, in such a short amount of time while being a full-time dad. That's like insane to me. Pulling off this whole project from, from just like notes on your phone. I'm sure when I saw you last, you've got like a book that's ready to go. It's, it's coming out. Uh, the release date is April 9th, right? April 9th. Yeah. April 9th. I'll, I'll be linking to everything. Um, but yeah, and then not just like writing it, but taking care of all of the marketing and finding editors and all this other stuff. And like, like I was going to say, I, I have a, I have at least a small insight into what like your life is like as a dad, because you were here for a month. <laughs> That's just totally mind boggling to me. So major kudos on that. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's almost more incredible than your walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how to how to write a book. I mean, uh, to to be fair, Alana was uh, very supportive and and helping in that. But yeah, uh, how to write a book and and put it out to publish. You know, I started the last week when we were at your place, and that was the end of October. And yeah, yeah everything's everything's writing wise is finished up now. And then I early on had to figure out or had to prioritize writing when I had free bits of time, just because I can't write when, when Dean's around, just cause she's just like chaotic and, you know, making noises and wanting to see what you're doing and whatever. So if basically like most of the book was written during her naps. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> once, once she went down, once I got her down for a nap or when I got her down for a nap, you know, it just have to be go right to writing. And then, yeah, basically training myself to, go right into writing mode without having, uh, you know, long blocks of time to be able to think about things. Yeah. And I, I did have that too, but, um, for, on some occasions, but yeah. And I, I found that was really helpful. There were times I struggled because I didn't really have those long blocks of time. I would, you know, she'd only be sleeping for like 40 minutes or something. I feel like I have to jump in and, you know, I can't really think about how things are going, but yeah, it worked out. Well, you know, it's interesting because on the one hand, that sort of flies in the face of things I think about, right? Like, oh, you need long blocks of time to get, you know, like good work done, deep work done or whatever. But on the other hand, the structure of that, like, oh, she's down for a nap, like it's go time and you know that your time is limited, makes you extremely focused, I would imagine. Uh, whenever, whenever, whenever you're not too sleep deprived or whatever else to like be right. physi physiologically able to do it, like. I can see that that'd be an incredible focusing time. So it's like, whereas me, like I'll wake up and I'll be like, oh yeah, I mean, I've got all day literally to do whatever I want. And so sometimes <laughs> I'll just park around, do this or that. So it's like, it'll take me three hours and I might've gotten like as much work as you got done in a 45. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, to be clear, I still do that too sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> One of my reactions upon reading the first draft of your book was that I, I, I backpacked, I've spent some time in the outdoors and like, so I kind of knew, I had an idea of like the m approximate magnitude of difficulty that just going on the PCT was. And then uh, obviously I don't have a kid, but I just know that that's hard, even if you're not doing anything else. And so it's like, I knew that what you guys had done was very difficult. But then when I read your book, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> that was really <laughs> hard. <laughs> like it kind of yeah. blew my mind. And it, it's kind of, it's actually also interesting because, because I mean, Alana showed up a few weeks before the end of your trip and then you showed up 
And uh, so I was like kind of there, like I, I observed you guys at the end of it. And I didn't, I couldn't tell from the outside how like the magnitude of experience that it was that you went through, which to me is for one thing is like speaks to the magic of writing because like I got so much like into the heart of your story from your book and your writing, which was really cool. But um, yeah, it was just, it really blew my mind to read about uh, how, how difficult it was, just like the bare logistics of it. Um, the, I mean, the sleep deprivation, I guess, is, is what like jumps out at me. Like you're throwing sleep deprivation on top of 20 mile days, right. on top of like no rest and like this big thing. So, okay, so I mean, actually, was that, what was your experience of the difficulty like? Obviously, you, you had some idea of what you were in for before the trip. And you knew it wasn't going to be a picnic. But now that you've done it and looking back on it, like, were you, were you surprised? Like, was the level of difficulty even more than you thought it was going to be? Or like, what, what, what was your sort of before and after perspective of that? Yeah, before the trip, we definitely knew like the sleep deprivation obviously wasn't a big surprise. Um, you know, I, I wrote in there and, and you know that our daughter ended, you know, she never, she always had difficulty sleeping through the night until recently, I might add. <laughs> um, it's been really nice. But um, uh, prior to the trip, you know, we started the trip when she was nine months old. Before she was nine months old, she hadn't, she hadn't ever slept through the night once. And most of the time that meant she was waking up two to three times sleeping for at best like a three hour stretch and then waking up and, you know, being up for half an hour or whatever and getting comforted or fed back to sleep. And so even when we were training and, and preparing for the trip, we were sleep deprived, sleep deprived. We wanted to, you know, exercise and, and train beforehand, but there were a lot of days where we just didn't end up doing anything or not feeling motivated to do something just because we were so tired. And that's before, you know, that's when we were trying to hike maybe, you know, five miles around the neighborhood or just go up and down the local ski hill, something like that, you know, just like an hour long trip. And then, yeah, we're going to go into this much larger trip where we're having to not do it just for an hour, but, you know, up to, to 10 hours or more per day. And so early on, it, it became clear um, whether we acknowledged it or not that, you know, we um, at least I, you know, I underestimated the difficulty of the trail. Um, and I think, you know, it's largely due to our circumstances and, and having more weight and being sleep deprived. Um, but yeah, going, going into it, you know, we do all our trips in Alaska nowadays, or, you know, some, sometimes elsewhere, but mostly in Alaska where we're going off trail, we have to cross rivers, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have to do our navigation, going to mountains, et cetera. And so the idea of the PCT, it's like, oh yeah, there's, there's a trail right there. It's like, how is that going to be hard? You know, you don't have to navigate. You could just walk down down the trail it's a hard path it's dry and you know all these other people do it and so so why can't we and um yeah we just you know starting early on we kind of got beat down <laughs> and that kind of <laughs> continued throughout the the whole stretch you know we we adapted to it i think to to a great extent um in in that we're able to do this you know it, able to hike 20 miles 20 plus miles a day um throughout the whole stretch of the trip but yeah definitely in throughout washington um it took quite a bit of adjusting that was our first three weeks or so um until until we got to oregon we weren't really we were still getting acclimatized to the trail and it, it was just it was pretty difficult if you if you were to jump back in time a year or so uh, you know back in time to when you were still prepping um what would you yeah what would you do differently we definitely, we definitely both um, enjoyed having done the trip. We wouldn't, we wouldn't not do the trip again, even though, you know, reading the book, we both, we both had, had different experiences um, and uh, between Alana and myself. Um, but I think much of, much of what the, the problems that we faced were pretty easily mitigated um, just by a few simple changes. Uh, one would be, lengthening the amount of time that we could be out on the trail. We decided to hike southbound from Hearts Pass to south of the Canadian border in Washington, going south through Washington, Oregon, and California. And because of that, we had a compressed time scale or time, yeah, time scale compared to other people who 
the vast majority of people start heading north from the Mexican border. And by doing that, they're able to get through, typically able to get through the Sierra, um, the Sierras in California by, I don't know, August, late summer. And so they don't have to really worry about snow as much. They have to face mm -hmm. it in Washington, but yeah. it's not as bad as the mountains aren't as high as, as in the Sierras. Whereas, you know, we had to get through the Sierras, you know, I think the, the average snow falls sometime in the, in the first to the second week of, of October. And so we started July 8th and that would give us, you know, what is that? Three months, three months to get south. And to do that, you know, it basically requires us to go 20 miles per day mm -hmm. um, every day um, to, to be able to get through the mountains in time. So just by allowing us more time and not having to, to feel like we're, we're racing against the clock, um, we would have been able to hike at a slower pace. Um, and I think, you know, that would have mitigated some of the physical stress and we could have, you know, a lot of night could have, we could have taken more breaks. We could have napped during the day. And so that, that's a big component. I think that we, we both change. We wouldn't, we probably wouldn't try to do the whole trail again if we were heading southbound. Yeah. I, I think I think that's probably the biggest one. The time timing wise and, and pace. Compare and contrast your base weight to a typical through hiker base weight. Like not the not the insane ones, but just like a like right. what, a, what, is a, what is a good ultralight BCT through hike base weight, and then contrast that with what you guys. Yeah, do. yeah. I'd say I'd say anywhere like to give a broad range would be anywhere to ten to twenty pounds. Probably on the lower end of that would be an average through hiker, maybe ten to fifteen pounds, um, and that's you know they're living live in the high life. They've got their own tent with mosquito netting. They've got a floor. They're using an inflatable sleeping pad. Some will have, you know, down sleeping bags and, you know, excess clothes, whatever. And yeah, so then contrast that with us. And at least one of us is carrying Dean who weighed 21 pounds at the start of our trip. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not to mention anything in our, in our pads or packs. And so the way we went about it was, you know, we have one, one pack with which was the baby carrier um which weighed eight pounds itself and then we put dean in that and it had a little bit of room for gear and we could put you know a few small things but then the other pack or gear pack um basically had everything else and that was probably uh, anywhere from probably 20 pounds at the lightest but probably most often about 25 pounds yeah and so base, base weight or base actual, weight base yeah weight, base yeah weight. And yeah, so, so not, just, not just quick interjection for people who don't, who, who, who might not be familiar with the jargon, base weight means weight of your gear, not including food and water. So that doesn't right. mean that Jack was running around with a 20 pound pack. He was running around with a 20 pound pack before he put food and water in it. And right. often you were carrying like five plus days worth of food for not just one person, but for three people, uh, two, two right. adults and a baby, right? So yeah, that's, that's kind of nuts. Right, yeah, so I mean, early on, we had the idea that we would we'd try to keep our packs respectively around like 30 pounds. Alana was carrying Dean starting out and for if she carried her for if half, if not, if not two thirds of the hike or, or maybe even more. Um, but then I carried the, the gear pack and, and the idea was that, you know, Alana would basically take Dean in the pack, which would be, you know, about 30 pounds um, and some toiletries and things like that. And then I'd take everything else and ideally that would be about 35 pounds. Yeah. But um yeah, I don't know if our calculations are off or, or yeah, if we're just not good at math or what, but yeah, later on we'd weigh our packs and, and that would be including food and stuff later on. But, um, and I guess those, those measurements I just mentioned were including food as well, but you know, we'd, we'd weigh our food or weigh our packs at scales and be like more like 45 and 40 and 45 pounds. So it was heavier than the expected. And yeah. so, yeah, going, going with that, um, because our packs were heavier, you know, you can only a heavier pack makes you slower so we can it's it's harder for us to travel the same amount of miles as, as somebody else with it you know who has a 10 pound base weight versus us carrying double and yeah. because of that you know they can travel faster and because they can travel faster they don't have to take as much food um they don't have to necessarily carry as much water because they're they're crossing streams more frequently etc yeah and so yeah it, it kind of compounds a little bit sure so yeah i mean you guys are basically doing the pct on hard mode for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> The obvious question here is, uh, you, you guys, you guys had a not not quite a one year old, and you decided to hike uh, in the wilderness from Canada to Mexico. Not a whole lot of people do that. I mean, not a whole lot of people decide to do that on their own. 
uh, much less with a baby. What was the reaction that you got from people before and then on the hike? Actually, and then now, since it's been a few months uh, after the hike, now that you've done it and you're all still alive and healthy and everything. <laughs> so like, what, what, what was the kind of arc of, of responses mm -hmm. of, of people to that? Uh, before it was mostly skeptical, if not, um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it at skeptical, uh, people <laughs> basically not ble believing or kind of, I don't know, somewhat shocked that we're, we're going to even attempt something like that. And yeah, we get, you know, people like make that scrunched up face, like you're going to, you're going to hike the PCT. What are you going to do about the baby? I'm like, oh, she's coming with like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, that was like, I'm sure people are talking to <laughs> behind her back. But uh, yeah, there, there, we got a bunch of uh, a bunch of people who are skeptical about it and, and questioning, you know, because yeah, like you said, it's it's not a common thing, and um, most people when they have a a baby or you know they're starting a family, they're settling down, um, and they're not necessarily looking to do something that goes out and and yeah, being exposed out in in wild elements for five months at a time. Um, we did have. Um, quite a few friends who were supportive of our trip and offered help, yourself included. And we, we enjoyed receiving the support, but at the same time, we weren't opposed to people being skeptical about it. Um, we just found that a lot of the people's reactions were more indicative of um, their own experiences rather than, you know, what we wanted to do. We, we acknowledge that, you know, that's what we did is not something for everybody, um, but we felt that we were prepared to do something like that. And we, we were able to mitigate anything that came up. And so, yeah, um, going into it, we didn't have too many supporters. Once we started, um, that changed even probably the week before we, we got going. Um, some of the people were skeptical, you know, um, were offering us more support. And then on the trail, it was overwhelmingly positive, uh, which was really inspiring. And it was really, maybe not inspiring. It was enheartening to us that so many people were inspired by what we were mm -hmm. doing. Um, especially early on, we would encounter many people who, you know, it's it's really rare to not only have a baby, but kids on the trail. You don't see many kids out there. Yeah. Um, there were two other families at the time, but out on the trail during, during the summer while we were out there. But other, you know, yeah, people, it's, it's limited. People basically like, oh, are you this family? We're like, no, we're, you know, our own, our own thing. But it was a quick side tangent. Yeah, there's, there's this famous family who was out on the trail. They've done, the PCT was their third trail last year. They've done, oh. they have five kids or six kids, something like that. And keep going from like age two to, to 15 or something. Um, and they all hiked on the trail together. And, um, and their baby's name is Deadweight. <laughs> 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 so we, we, <laughs> every time we go on the trail, we'd be hiking along and, and yeah, we we didn't inevitably run into somebody and they'd be like, Oh, you're out for the weekend or something I'm like no, we're we're through hiking and they're like, Oh, really? I'm like, have you guys heard about Deadweight? And we're like, Yeah, we've heard about <laughs> Wait, um, and to clarify, dead, Deadweight is the baby's trail name, not like correct, correct. Yeah. Deadweight's trail name. Yeah. Every, everyone gets trail names actually. on the trail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was overwhelmingly positive. We had people cheering us on, um, people asking questions, people asking to take pictures with us. And um yeah, that was that was really enheartening for us, and that really helped motivate us, especially during some of the tougher sections. Um, then after the trail, it, it's pretty much been the same same way. Um, people kind of inspired by what we've done. Um, it, it's kind of incredible. I, we didn't really anticipate so many people, you know, having such a positive um, positive takeaway from from our trip. But um, I think just being able to do that and showing the possibilities, not not in that, you know, the families have to hike the PCT or do something that we did, but the idea that, yeah, you could take your kids out if you want. Um, or even if you don't have kids, you could try something, you know, that's outside the norm. And you might have a good, you might have a bad experience, but, you know, you'll learn a lot. And um, there are, are a lot of positives. Yeah, we don't, we don't regret anything we did. But um, it made me think of uh, when I rode my bike to Oregon last year. I was in Northern California uh, at Cody's wedding, and uh, at, at that time I was I was considering uh, ending my ride there and just taking the train to finish out, you know, my my trip or whatever. And uh, and at the, at the wedding, you know, um, people heard what I was doing, and some people like came up and like thanked me for what mm -hmm. I was doing, and yeah. it just like blew my mind. And because 
I, I don't know. I mean, I was just riding my bicycle, like, on the highway. Like, I wasn't in the wilderness. I was stopping at grocery stores every day. Like, it wasn't that big of a deal. I just, like, got on my bike every day, you know? But they were, like, thanking me for doing this inspiring thing. And it, like, it, it like, reframed the trip from kind of being about me to almost, in a way, being about other people. And I, I don't really know how to articulate it, but it was it was definitely, like, it definitely created a different sensation in myself about what I was doing and maybe like why I was doing it. I don't know, just the impact. Um, and, I, and then I, I wrote out the rest of the trip. I was like, I'm not getting on the train. These people think that I can't let them down, you know? Right. It's kind of a funny thing. Um, right. was, that, that was like a real, that was a pretty relatively short trip. Um, so I can, I right. can, it made me, you know, what you just said about like the, the feeling of having people be not just supportive, but like inspired by what you did. Um, I think that's a really cool feeling. Right. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure what it is, but like, yeah, like, like you, I mean, you were riding your bike and you're riding your bike within, you know, California and the U S for the most part, you weren't like world traveling and, and like yeah. us, we just felt we were, you know, walking with our, with our daughter. Um, but yeah, for, for whatever reason, I don't know if, if people just need to see other people trying different things or, um, living more adventurously, but yeah, people, people seem to get a lot from, from, doing things like that yeah yeah well I, I i mean i definitely have gotten a lot out from knowing about and reading about your trip and talking with you about it kind of like like well if these guys can go through this i have <laughs> no excuse not to try some other things every once in a while <laughs> um now I, I also wanted to highlight you and alana are very 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 experienced outdoors people mm -hmm. um and uh i think that's worth highlighting and underlining that you know it's not like you went straight from a city life or a suburban life and then took your entire family out into the wilderness uh you've got not not only do you have a lot of experience but you have a lot of training like you and alana were both at at one time certified emts and all this other stuff so you, you you've got a stack of experiences that made you confident that you'd be able to reasonably approach any kind of emergency situation that you might have, which you in fact did, which I don't know if we want to spoil it or not, but you had some serious life or death situations on the show um, that obviously everyone is, is healthy and fine from. With that in mind, are there people that you would not advise to go on the trail, either with or without a family? I, I, w I think it's pretty forgiving. You know, most people who start the trail, whether it's the Appalachian Trail or the PCT or whatever, haven't hiked at all before. And so it's, there There are a lot of people who fail because of that. You know, they, they romanticize it or it's just not what they want to do and they end up, you know, turning around. But it's it's really forgiving in the sense that, like I was saying earlier, it is a dirt path and generally it's pretty straightforward. You don't really have to do much navigation. Um, there are other people out there and you're coming across towns, you know, every often three to four days. And so if, if you were to try something like that, um, there are a lot of bailout points if, if something were to happen. And that's part of the reason, you know, we were, wanted to undertake something like this and we felt comfortable taking something like this in addition to our experiences, um, in that we could, you know, if something went wrong, there are a lot of points where we could leave the trail and um change our plans and so yeah i, I think you know you you'll you'll basically be be tossed into the what is it tossed in the meat grinder and, and learn a lot if you if you don't have any experience um if if you do have kids if you have a family and you haven't done anything like this before i'd recommend trying something else beforehand we did do a last time we talked on this podcast uh, we were doing a trip throughout the southwest and that was when Dean was six weeks old. Yeah, Alan and I um, and Dean drove drove down to the Southwest Desert, Utah, and Arizona, and uh, New Mexico, and we did some hiking around there and just day hikes. But from doing that, we were comfortable that we could take take Dean out and, and be able to manage it. So yeah, once once you're introducing kids, you know you have a lot more that can go wrong because they're not necessarily. Um, and they can't really take care of themselves as i mean as depending on how young they are um and so you need to be able to make sure like not only your stuff is is dialed in but that of your kids as well so if you don't have any experience hiking or 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 even taking out your kids and your your family i, I wouldn't recommend trying something like we did just off the bat yeah. um, but 
I, 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 that being said, it is something like the trail and, you know, there's trails throughout the country. Um, there it's pretty accessible for if you wanted to, to do it as a family, or if you, if you hadn't done any hiking before and being able to scale up from that. Um, there's lots of resources and, you know, there's, there's plenty of people who do it each year. A year ago, I read the book Death in the Grand Canyon, which is mm. what it sounds like it's about. And it's kind of a grim book, but all the, the chapters are organized by the ways in which, like the, the cause of death, right? So there's, uh, there's aircraft, there's the river, there's falling, and then there's lots of uh, heat related, heat and dehydration related uh, fatalities. And in the chapter on falling in, the author noted that there are no reported incidences of children falling over the hmm. edge and dying. Um, plenty of adults do, they get too close, they're taking a selfie, they're like, for whatever reason, there's a lot of like accidental fall-ins, all adults. And you would almost expect like, oh my God, children, they don't know what they're doing, they're running around and like they do run around, but they don't fall in, which is an interesting point that like, um, I mean, obviously this is a little bit older than uh, Dean, but uh, yeah, like kids generally don't fall into the Grand Canyon, which uh, I would not have expected, but you know, really, right. it's kind, of, it kind of interesting to think that, like, yeah, I don't know, they do have some sense of self-preservation, at least insofar as not to accidentally fall into the Grand Canyon, more than adults do, which is, which is really right. interesting. The author got into a little bit, like, um, you know, that by the time you reach adulthood, perhaps, you know, the hypothesis is kind of like you spend so much time in a, in a Disney-fied world that has guardrails and everything and protects you and you just kind of learn that like you can't be harmed because you're essentially in a, in a video game um and that maybe uh impacts your relationship with certain kinds of common sense risk relationships that kids haven't been indoctrinated out of yet right so. right yeah and i i think that that's also a testament to you know what what type of childhood and, and how we want to raise Dean and that we don't necessarily want to be, have her be coddled and, and surrounded by, you know, padded surfaces and telling her not to do things. And so part of that is, you know, being okay with exposing her to risks and, and things outside of our control and something like the trail is, um, you know, a perfect example of that there's, there's a lot that, that can happen. It'll start raining, you know, there's cold, there's there's smoke it's potential for fire there's there's lots of things that go wrong but i think you know our modern western society is it's really recent in that we don't allow kids to do dangerous things things that adults do and you know some of that makes sense you know kids shouldn't go down in a coal mine or something but <laughs> um, reading uh jared diamond has a book the world until yesterday where he goes around and he talks about, um, I think it was Papua New Guinea he went to somewhere in, in, in that part of the world. But there are different tribes and he was, he was looking at some of the hunter-gatherer tribes that are still alive today and, and kind of comparing a bunch of different things. Um, like how there's, you know, there's often the, the murder rate was more was higher than, than it is currently um, per capita. And then, but also things with regards to child raising. And one of the things he noted was how there much more hands off than you know like the helicopter parents i guess for example today in that mm. kids could be around fire kids could be around like knives and things and he was amazed because you know he didn't see generally you know most kids i think he, he mentioned you know there's every like there's always like one kid who had some burn marks or something but otherwise you know the kids didn't have they had all their fingers they didn't have any burn <laughs> marks um and then i was reading i was trying to find it before we were talking but i was reading something um about another group um, today and they let their kids starting at nine months old start using axes and, and basically training them how to do things mm. with axes mm. and um yeah i think i think that just speaks to i don't know it's 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 basically a, a level of intelligence like we we kind of yeah i don't know if it's doing fine and like kids are you know innocent and and they are to a certain degree but but extended that too far and that they're not able to do anything mm. and that you know they we've kind of bred out their their desire to do things by basically like creating cultivating this mindset you know that they're kind of incapable and not being able to to yeah try risky things whereas you know even as much as a uh, hundred years ago i think i don't know if it was in the u.s or elsewhere but there was a captain um i think it was david farragut i don't know if david was his first name but captain farragut he was 
manning a ship. He was a captain of a ship at like nine years old or 12 years old, something ridiculous like that <laughs> in the Navy. <laughs> so it's like, and obviously that's an extreme example, but I mean, if you know, a 12 year old can, can man a ship, you know? Yeah. Uh, you made me think of uh, one of my favorite uh, memories of uh, Jasper, Megan's kid. Mm -hmm. he's, he's barefoot he's wearing wearing pajama pants he's standing on top of a pile of firewood that in their front yard and he's got his dad's axe in his hand <laughs> i just look over at him and he's like i don't know he's like oh and he's got like a bug in his other hand I think. right right his dad's there and he's like yep that's fine you know like he's <laughs> good like, so be, they, they both trained him to be uh him, him to be conscientious with the sharps and stuff but it's, it's right cool. um and he's still got <laughs> to date as I understand it, he's still got all his fingers as well. Do you, so do you, um, uh, well, you're, you're, you're about to return home for a little bit and, and probably like enjoy being home for the first time in, in quite a few months uh, soon. But do you have, what are your uh, future plans for trips or uh, adventures as a family? Or are you as even a, thinking about that or? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, as a family, we probably won't do any hiking trips anytime soon. Um, <laughs> well, especially now because she started walking after she she couldn't walk when we were on the trail, and right. um, even when you're at your place after she was she was starting. But um, yeah, starting a couple of weeks after we left in in early November, she started walking, and now she walks everywhere, and she's she's really happy. So either carrying her, it's it's too much, or or she she would rather walk, um, and. So yeah, but maybe I don't know something like we really enjoy. Um, we we've, we've done Alana and I have done one bike trip together. Um, you know, similar in style, not as far as, as what you did, but similar in style, and we really enjoyed that. And I think adding a kid along with that is is pretty reasonable, as well as maybe something floating. Um, and and we have pack rafts and doing something in Alaska and on one of the rivers or maybe a canoe or something like that would be really easy <laughs> in, in comparison um so yeah something like that i mean there, there's a bunch of stuff we want to do in alaska and, and we kind of thought about that um in before we decided on, on doing the pct in that that it, it was kind of a golden window that we had and that she couldn't walk but she didn't weigh that much yet and so we could just pack her around and, and be able to do so many miles a day um and versus like if we wanted to float or do something like that you know we can do that with her at any age um and so something that required a lot of walking like that yeah we would but it made sense at that time but yeah i think <laughs> we're not doing any long trails um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair enough so you're used to having outdoor adventures in alaska both recreationally and professionally um what was your experience of the lower 48 wilderness uh compared mm. to what you're used to up there because you, you already mentioned uh you know you're used to being off trail and it's wet and there's bugs and other things like that and uh, from one perspective the pct is going to be easier because it's a uh, dirt path mostly dry etc so how did you uh yeah what was your experience of the wilderness uh, mm -hmm. of the trail mm -hmm. yeah um going into it we we didn't expect it to be the same to alaska you know just because for one, there's there's so many people who are either on the trail as through hikers or, you know, just backpacking or out for a day hiking like that. And so just the, the density of people was, was bound to be higher. And then, you know, we're going through much more, I guess, civilized areas in comparison to, to something like Alaska. Um, but even so, I guess, starting in Washington, we were kind of surprised at, at what we found um neither of us had really known much about the pct before doing it and like in, in what it entailed like what type of terrain we'd go through and what what the areas were like a lot had worked on it before she she worked when she was doing trail crew work but outside of that um you know we read a couple books and and we're we're kind of i guess um yeah we didn't we didn't know what was to come and and so the trail travels through all kinds of different areas, national forests, national parks, and official wilderness, and, and uh, some native reservations and things like that. And yeah, starting from early on, it was, it was just really surprising um, how impacted everything was um, in that, you know, campsites everywhere. Um, there's often 
trash and, and you know it's to be expected but more so than than what we what we thought um was i guess reasonable um and then just a lot of people and that was probably the the biggest difference and that kind of contributes to everything else um and it's yeah it's you know i'm, I'm i don't want to be like oh these people are out there if you know i get to hike the pct and have it to myself <laughs> that's definitely not not my viewpoint um you know we're part of the crowd just like everybody else and but it it's a different experience than than what we pictured we thought it we'd go into it and find something that you know could be life-changing or something like that and have a wilderness immersive experience and it was it was not that and you know the alternative i i still enjoyed it um myself but it was it was not that immersive experience i guess in in, in context i'd taken the national outdoor leadership school in those course in mm. 2013 in alaska and that was my introduction to, to backpacking and, and being in the outdoors in general and we were out for at one point, 50 days straight in Wrangell St. Elias National Park in Alaska. Um, and we only encountered our resupply pilot and a state trooper during that time. And so that was, you know, totally immersive. That had me hooked on like big landscapes and totally changed my life. <clears throat> I think I mentioned that in our, in our last talk. But yeah. um, so I guess I, I kind of went into it thinking that the PCT would be somewhat similar experience to that. And, um, it, it wasn't even even going against the grain of or going against the flow of most of the traffic. Most people hiked northbound. We went southbound. We still encountered quite a few people, and um, yeah, it, it just wasn't in line with our expectations. And it, that took some getting used to as well. That was part of our trail acclimatization, trail acclimatization process. Uh, yeah, this was mostly. I mean, we mostly covered this in in our first chat. But for, for people who might not have seen that yet, how um, were you able to just not work for five months and go hiking on the PCT? Do you have a trust yeah. fund? <laughs> yeah, I got, I got a few trust funds. <laughs> 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 no. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, I guess, you know, the same stuff you talk about um in some of your other episodes and it's it's kind of lifestyle design and right before that that same <clears throat> right before that summer i did the Knowles course i i came across you know books alaska some alaskan books that prompted me on that journey but in that same time period i came across you know your money your life and early retirement extreme which got me kind of on the trajectory to be more intentional about how i spend my money um and basically putting a lot of money aside um, just in that I didn't find a lot of value in, and I don't find a lot of value in, in spending on most things. And by doing that, basically, you know, by not spending enough or by not spending a lot and defining what's important to me, able to save a lot of money and then be able to go out and do things um, like the PCT and not have to work. I mean, there's people who are able to make it work who are, I would say, not necessarily of that mindset. You know, there's definitely the YOLO crowd and, and people, you know, <laughs> saving up to, <laughs> to the low bunch of money or, or whatever. But oh, people, are, people are still able to. I, I, I see that online a lot, a big question, you know, in, in how people are able to get that much time off work or something like that. And I guess full disclosure, I, I the job I've, I've been doing recently, I work for my dad in his insurance business. And so it is the family business. And But nonetheless, you know, I, I was... I asked for time off without the expectation that I, I wasn't honestly sure if, if he'd, he'd let me do it, but I basically framed it as that I'm telling him that I'm doing this, this trip. And, and if he was like, well, you know, you can't do it. I'm like, okay, well then, you know, I'm going to quit and having the money and being able to do that and, and having the confidence to be able to live the lifestyle we wanted to live um, was kind of empowering. Because of that, um, as it stands, he is fine with me taking it off that somebody else do do my work, and um, I took that time off without pay. That was probably one of the most foundational elements of being of us even considering doing something like this. Like money, at, at no point was was a factor in like mm. if we had to you know worry about 
we we had you know designs and like not wanting to spend a lot but we didn't really necessarily plan for a budget and have to worry about like not spending a certain amount of money and that's because of all that prior um all that prior work and, and thought would it be correct to say that probably most people who do the pct they've uh, they've saved up for this one trip. They've taken time off. They're in between things, so they're they're maybe in a less uh, less secure status than you are. So I'm wondering, actually, if that's almost um, like is that a safety issue? One and then two is that a um, is that an issue for the kind of experience you're going to have? And what I mean by that is, if if you saved up for a long time and this is your one shot at it, and you want to push through, and you have this vision of like every single mile. And then there's a dangerous snowpack in the Sierras or whatever. Like for someone who's like, this is their, they feel like this is their one shot at it. I wonder if that is going to contribute to them. A, either making um, perhaps irresponsible decisions, putting putting their situation in danger by pushing through or, you know, making it or feeling bad when they do make the safe decision because they're like, ah, this was my one shot. Like I'm wondering if they might have more of a sense of anxiety where you... Uh, I mean, this was a kind of a golden window for you, like you said, but at the same time, it's not like you didn't like scrimp and save and sacrifice for years, right. this one shot, right? So there's kind right. of a, almost a different like perspective uh, or approach that you that you had. Do you have, do you have thoughts on that? That's a really interesting angle. I, I, I haven't thought about that explicitly, but it makes me think of on, you know, the breakdown of people on the trail, most of at least half if not most of the hikers are foreigners and so not only are they having to contend with you know money issues but um or think about money and visa and so they have to worry about having a visa they only have a visa for a specific period of time and from what we witnessed a lot of the the foreigners were more of the mindset you know of hiking every mile and, and being willing to push through and i think kind of kind of speaking to that point of yeah this is my one shot um, this is all I have. And whereas, yeah, we, you know, we, we spent a bunch of money on, cause we, we prepare our food and everything in advance. So we spent, you know, a couple thousand dollars or so of, of, um, on, on food items. And so if, if we were to quit, I mean, we didn't finish the trail. Um, and so we ended up, yeah, we have food waiting at, at home for us, but, um, yeah, I guess, I guess my point is, is, or like what you're saying, the, the downsides for us were a lot less from quitting because we're at the point like if we wanted to do the trail this year, you know, we could do it. Yeah. I, I don't think I can get five months off and we have again, but I, I just quit. <laughs> yeah. And we could, yeah, we, yeah. Could do, we could do it again. Whereas, you know, like, like you said, there's a lot of people um, quit their job or, you know, they're saving up for years to do something like this. There's not a lot of professions where you can just take time off like that. You know, there's a few teachers out there, but most people did something like quit their job and, and start on the on the trail, yeah. or there are, there are older people who aren't necessarily working. Yeah, I, I'm I'm remembering. Um, I think it was a blog or oh, it was actually a Reddit thread. Someone who rode his motorcycle around the U.S. Um, he was like an "ask me anything" kind of thing, and it came out that he basically he quit his job. He got on his motorcycle and he just rode around until he ran out of money and then he went back and got a job. But like he didn't want to quit. He wanted to keep doing his thing. Mm -hmm. It's also funny. People asked him what he spent the most money on and he said beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> but, um, Another interesting side point about the the culture on the trail and how it's, it's changed over the years is the role of technology and that now everybody... Um, everybody has a smartphone, or almost everybody has a smartphone. If it's not everybody, there's probably a handful of individuals who don't. But everybody has a smartphone, and everybody, for mapping, there's an app called Far Out, which is just a mapping app, and you can make comments on, on you know, waypoints and things like that. And pretty much everybody uses that. And we, we heard of one person throughout the whole time who didn't use it. But um, because of that, you know, it's... We, we used it as well. Um, we saw it as an easy way to um, cut down on our preparations for the trip and not have to worry about navigating or things like that with the baby. We were looking for any shortcuts we could, and that definitely helped with that. Um, but I I think it does change the culture and the experience to a certain degree. 
and that we are relying on looking at our phones to basically see where we are. And it also, you know, it tells you where campsites are, where other people have camped and, and you know, they'll have comments about something like, oh, a really nice spot over here, or there's water and whatever. And, and so you, it takes out, I guess, a sense of the wonder about the trail and, and you can still get it, but I think there's, there's something to be said for um, having a less digital experience. And that's definitely not the pervasive culture now um, in both with using that app and then also on the trail, most people we walked past were wearing headphones and listening to something on, on the trail, um, which we, we found really surprising. Um, we both made it a point not to, we didn't bring any headphones. We wanted to, you know, I guess ex experience deal with our own thoughts and, and experience the trail as it was and, and not have some type of media there. But um, the vast majority of other through hikers were wearing headphones and listening to podcasts, music, audiobooks while they were hiking. And yeah, for some, for some people, you know, they were hiking by themselves. And it makes sense, especially if, you know, going day after day, but even in groups as well. Um, that was one of the most surprising things we encountered among, among other people. In what ways would you say that you're different now after the trip? Oh, uh, after the trip, I'd say, well, at least um, Alana and I have a, a much stronger relationship um, than before. We're in a better place. We can communicate. Um, we had some fireworks, which if anybody wants to read about them, they're, they're <laughs> detailed in the book. One thing we were kind of reminded with on the trail is you know, with our pace and having to having to keep up 20 miles a day all the time, we often felt like we were rushing. And so then Dean would be, you know, upset or fussing in her pack and we'd just like try to, you know, sing songs or pass her back um, snacks and try to keep her entertained so we can just keep going. But there were a few times where we were like, all right, nothing's working. We're frustrated and we're, we're going to have to stop. And we stop and, you know, we're either stopped at a lake or something or we're under some trees and we're just, we just end up playing with her. And it's like some of the best moments we had on the trail were when we decided, you know, we don't have to keep this, this pace and just be narrow minded, um, you know, trying to get every single mile instead of just like enjoying the moment. And I think that carries on probably anybody who has kids, you know, kids are always or often more so in the present moment than, than adults, especially if they don't have any screens. Um, and we're still reminded of that. Um, the biggest change, I think, I think Dean probably experienced, it's, it's the most visible out of, out of all of us, or at least that I, I can think of, in that she just wants to be outside all the time. Like now mm -hmm. we're, I don't know, it's, we ended at your house beginning of October, we're talking early March, five months after, and she just always wants to go outside. Like it was just raining here, we're, we're in Texas at the moment, um, but it was just raining here a couple of days ago. And it's like pouring rain and she wants to go outside. I'm like, you're not going to like it, it's raining. And we go outside and she's just like jumping in puddles. <laughs> and that's, I, I couldn't, I couldn't keep her inside like all day. So we're just walking up and down the block, jumping in puddles. <laughs> and yeah, I guess, you know, there's, there's probably, I don't know what extent. Um, I mean, maybe she would just be like that anyways, but I have to think that the, the PCT and being outside that much um, played a role in, in her wanting to do that. Um, yeah. I, I got to say that uh, I was I was blessed with a lot of positive experiences last year, but among among many of those, one near the top was getting to hang out with Dean for a week <laughs> while she was here. It was it was really cool, just like you said. Like they're in the moment all the time, and right. and if you're like if you're around them, you'll just get kind of sucked into that in a way. That yeah. was really nice, and just like helped me take myself less seriously. And like it was just great to see her laughing and like playing with rocks and yeah. climbing up down the stairs and everything. So yeah, um, that was very cool. Well, that was, sounds like a journey of a lifetime, but also just one, one adventure uh, of all the rest that you're going to have as a family. So it was really cool to read about your adventure and also to get to experience this a little bit at the end there to uh, see you guys. At yeah. The end. So thanks, Tyler. You're you're a big help in in you know 
saving us a, <laughs> at some point and offering a, a place where we could relax and you and, and Cody and, and many others on the, on the trail. So we're really fortunate to have people like you who could help us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself, but I think I, I fairly confident I'm speaking for all the other people who were able to support you that it was an honor and a blessing to be able to be in a position to help you guys out in any way that oh, we could. I think I think we definitely felt that we got as, at least as much as we gave from that relationship. 